Good afternoon, I'm Reverend Henry. I'm your Bible teacher for the hour. And our subject today is forgiving as God's people. From Matthew chapter five, verses 17 through 26, we're in the midst of a good time. The lesson today is coming from Matthew chapter five and verses 17 through 26. And the subject is forgiving as God's people. And we took this lesson from my golden text of Matthew 5, 23 and 24. And it reads as thus. If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberst that your brother has aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go by the way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Today we want to show that the Christian life is about practical obedience and forgiveness. And the importance of it is to see that when we forgive, we love as God's people ought to love. And the more that we practice this, we'll remember that if we do, we'll remember that if we do not forgive from the heart, we are not acting like Christians. And today our outlines is coming from Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. And that we'll be dealing with the Jesus and the Old Testament. And then we'll go into Matthew 5, 21 through 26. And we'll be dealing with Jesus and the prohibition against murder. In Matthew 5 and 17, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verse 18, For verily, verily, I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, until all be fulfilled. Verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men to do so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell's fire. 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thou hast aught against thee, thy yeah, brother, leave the altar, verse 24, before leave the, your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Verse 25. Agree with your adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him. Least at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer, officer and the officer cast you into prison. 26. Verily I say unto you, 
thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. Certainly after the crowd heard our Lord's description of the kind of person that God blesses, they said to themselves, but we can never attain that kind of character. How can we have this righteousness? Where does it come from? They wondered how his teaching related to what they had been taught all their lives. What about Moses and the law? In the law of Moses, God certainly related his standards for holy living. The Pharisees defended the law and sought to obey it. But Jesus said that it was true righteousness that pleases God. And that must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. And to the common people, the scribes and Pharisees were the holiest men in the community. If they had not attained, what hope was there for anyone else? Jesus explained that his own attitude toward the law of Moses. Let us listen to Jesus as he uh, did this. Jesus fulfilled the laws of the kingdom, and we need the law of Moses. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Don't think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law until all be fulfilled. I hope you don't misinterpret what we are saying in this section, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. We are not saying that we are free to break the Mosaic law. The fact of the matter is that the law is still a standard. It reveals to us that we cannot measure up to God's standard. This should drive us to the cross of Jesus Christ. The only way we can fulfill the law is by accepting the only one who could fulfill it? And that's Jesus Christ. We are not free to sin. Matthew 5, 19 so it told us, Whosoever break one of the least of my commandments and teach men to do the same, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You cannot break the commandments and get by with it. But you cannot keep them in your own strength. The only way we can keep them is to come to Jesus Christ for salvation, power, and strength. The commandments are not a way of salvation, but a means to show us the way to salvation through the acceptance of the work of Jesus Christ. We need to come to Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's very important to see his point right here. The Pharisees had a high degree of righteousness according to the law, but that was not acceptable. How can you and I surpass their righteousness? It's impossible in our own efforts. We need Jesus Christ to do it for us. Christ likeness. When the wife of missionary told her husband that a newspaper article likened him to some of the apostles, he replied, I don't want to be like Paul or any mere man. I want to be like Christ. I want to follow him only, copy his teachings, drink of his spirit, place my feet in his footsteps. 
Oh, I want to be more like Christ. Jesus and the prohibition against murder. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. We need a Savior. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill will be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, will be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, will be in danger of hell's fire. This is a tremendous statement. It means that if you're angry with your brother, you are a murderer. Do you claim to be keeping the Mosaic law? You cannot break the law and get by with it. You cannot get by with mouthing the, the boast that the, that the Sermon on the Mount is your religion and then break every part of it. Both you and I need a Savior who has perfectly kept the law and can impute to us his own righteousness. And that one is named Jesus Christ. Accepting Christ. In Korea, a man had two sons. The elder rose to become the chief justice in the land where the younger became an uh, infamous bandit. The elder brother loved his younger brother but was unable to persuade him to change his ways. Eventually, the younger brother was caught and brought before the older brother, the chief justice. Everyone in the courtroom thought the younger brother would get off because it was well known that the chief justice was his elder brother. But at the end of the trial, the chief justice sentenced his brother to death. On the day of the execution, the elder brother came to the prison and said to his brother, let's swap places. The younger brother agreed, thinking that once they realized that it was the elder brother, the execution would not go forward. On he went, up on the hill to watch the proceedings. His brother was brought out at, the, at dawn, and to, the, to his horror, he was executed. Filled with remorse, he ran down the hill, told the guard his name and that he was a criminal who should have been executed. The guard said to him, there is no sentence outstanding on anyone with that name. In the same way, Jesus Christ has died for our sins. There is no sentence outstanding. All we have to do is accept his death in our place. Jesus said that we should reconcile our conflicts. In verse 23 and 24, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that you have ought against your brother, leave your gift there before the altar, go your way, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. His illustration, having made a comparison between the command not to murder and the inner motive and heart intention of hatred, Jesus illustrated the seriousness of this matter by referring to one who would attempt to buy off his conscience by giving something to God without clearing his conscience with his offended brother. He reminded that if you bring your gift to the altar without reconciling to the offended party, God will not receive the gift. Bringing a gift to the altar refers to bringing it to the temple in order that it might be consecrated. The Lord's solution. Therefore, if conflict exists between any two people, it is God's desire that they reconcile the conflict 
before attempting to give a gift or an act to the service of the Lord. Many people undoubtedly try to suppress the guilt of their sin by an outward act that they hope would please God in some way. Therefore, Jesus commands we leave our gifts on the altars and first be reconciled to our brother before we offend them. To be reconciled means to be brought back into fellowship or favor with our fellow man. Having resolved the personal conflict we have been, but to return and perform the act of service to the Lord. The performance of our duty to men does not free us from the obligation of direct service to God. Jesus says that we should settle with our adversaries quickly. Verse 25, agree with your adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him. At least at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and you be cast into prison. The advantage that we have, the Lord Jesus went on to remind us that even if our adversary and opponent at the law disagrees with you, it is your advantage to reconcile with him before he delivers you to the judge. Many people make the foolish mistake of assuming that just because they think they're right in a given situation that God would necessarily vindicate them. Jesus' exhortation here is to urge us to go out of our way to avoid legal conflicts before human judges. Our payment is this. The payment of debt and the prison referred to simply means the normal legal procedures that one would encounter in a civil lawsuit. The term prison does not refer to purgatory as suggested by some Roman Catholic interpreters, but the full measure of punitive justice. Jesus says that his teaching is above the teaching of Moses. In verse 26, Verily I say unto you, You shall by no means come out of this until you have paid the uttermost fartling. Notice that Jesus said, Verily I say unto you. He is lifting his teaching above the teaching of Moses. He is lifting himself to the position of the lawgiver and also the interpreter, by the way, the warning he gives to us. Jesus warns against a controversial spirit and reluctant to admit guilt. It is better to promptly settle with an accuser rather than run the risk of a court trial. If that happens, we're bound to lose. While there is disagreement among scholars about the identity of the people in this parable. The point is clear. If you're wrong, be quick to admit it and make things right. If you remain unrepentant, your sin will eventually catch up with you and you will not only have to make full restitution, but suffer additional penalties as well. And do not be in a hurry to go to court. If you do, the law will find you out and you will pay to the last penny. What love, what has love got to do with it? Newspaper columnist and minister George Crane in his column wrote on the worry clinic. He told of a wife who came into his office full of hatred toward her husband. She said, I don't only want to get rid of him, I want to get even before I divorce him. I want to hurt him as much as he hurt me. Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. Go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you and praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be as kind, considerate, and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him, 
make him believe you love him after you convinced him of your undying love and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb on him. Tell him that you're getting a divorce and that will really hurt him. With revenge in her eyes, she smiled and exclaimed, beautiful, beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? And she did it with enthusiasm, acting as if for two months she showed love, kindness, listening, giving, reinforcing, sharing. And when she didn't return, he called. Are you ready now to go through with the divorce? Divorce, she exclaimed. Never. I discovered I really do love you. Her action had changed her feelings. Motion uh, resulted in emotion. The ability to love is established not so much by a fervent promise as often repeated deeds. The conclusion to this is other people should see in us what the Lord Jesus uh, himself would say and do if he were here, here in person. Going that extra mile turning that other chick, loving those who don't love us. Is your present reflection clear and beautiful because your life is like his? Or is the reflection somewhat crooked and twisted like a fun house mirror because your sins have marred, marred God's image? A thought for you to always remember, the Spirit of God enables us to obey the word of God. And we'll be a blessing not only to ourselves, but to God and others. That is our lesson for today. I pray that you all got something out of it, that it truly was a blessing to let you know how to forgive like you are people of God. Thank you so much. We had a beautiful lesson. I pray that everyone got something out of it. Thank you for your prayers and your feedbacks. And, and we'll continue to uh, stay faithful in, in uh, upholding the church, the word, God, and each other. In Jesus' name, amen.